Welcome to AP Chemistry at Hanega High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at ideas to help you with Chapter 17 tests. Now, this is a chapter that deals with um, various aspects of equilibria. We get into buffer situations. We get into common ion effect, which is honestly the same case of buffer when you're talking about an acid-base situation. Uh, we also get into uh, titrations and what's happening at various points in the titration with pH. And then finally, we get into low solubility substances. Uh, what affects their pH? What affects their solubility? And when can we determine if we've got a precipitate forming when we're mixing ions of these things together? So those are the things we're going to be looking at in this test help movie. And first, we're going to concentrate on some of the common errors and misconceptions I typically to see. Uh, from these ideas. First off, there's some things about units and sig takes. Always got to watch that. Then we've got to look at, you know, buffer situations, the weak, strong, and strong, strong titations. Some things related to common ion effect and the concept of precipitation. Now, as far as units, this is pretty much like the exact same stuff I showed with the last Tell Stop movie because we're primarily dealing with equilibrium situations here because we're dealing with other equilibrium situations. Remember KQ? in all of its forms, has no unit. Uh, don't forget when we're dealing with weak bases, we're dealing with a KB, not a KA. And when you're calculating X in those types of problems, it's going to deal with OH minus, not H plus. And remember, there's a relationship between KAs and KBs and H pluses and OH minuses, but be very aware of exactly what you're going to have and what they're asking for in a problem. Remember, with weak acids, you're getting H3O plus, and weak bases, you're going to be solving for OH minus. Big one for this chapter. When you see a molarity in a volume, you're going to get a number of moles. We use that situation in a number of situations here, so really watch out for that. Because with titrations and with uh, precipitation problems, you've got to be able to find out how many moles you've got and then divide that by the total volume to really get what the concentration is that you're looking at when you mix things together. Uh, when mixing solutions, make sure you get the total volume. That's related to what we looked at with number four. And then remember for sig figs, when you have a concentration with two sig figs, you're going to go to a p-value with two decimal places. And the final thing to watch out with units and sig figs is number seven. Remember, there's a difference between solubility and molar solubility. I know in how we've treated in the past, every time we talk about concentration, we're always talking about molar concentration. But when you say solubility, by definition, it's considered grams per liter. And if you're talking about molar solubility, you have to say molar solubility. So be careful. Is the problem asking for the solubility or the molar solubility? Because those are two different things. Vice versa. So be careful some units and some sig fig issues. Uh, one of the most common mistakes I see are really misunderstandings related to the concept of buffer system. You need to understand not just number one, the, the simple traditional way to make a buffer, when you take uh, a salt with a conjugate to a weak acid. So we got a weak acid, and the conjugate, the anion in that weak acid, um, if we've got a salt that contains that anion, we add it, yes, we're going to get a buffer situation. So acetic acid, sodium acetate makes a buffer. Ammonium with ammonium chloride, that's a base buffer system. Same thing. Anytime you have a weak with its conjugate from a salt, you're going to get a buffer. And that's the traditional way. Sometimes t people miss that, misunderstand it, but that's often the one people get. What they often misunderstand is the other two ways. When you have partial neutralizations, now you can have a weak acid, and if you partially neutralize it with a strong base, what you're going to end up doing is getting rid of a little bit of our weak acid, but you're still going to have a significant quantity of this weak acid. But what happens is the neutralization reaction produces its conjugate. So what we're going to end up with here is a significant quantity of a weak acid and its conjugate base. We will have a significant quantity of both of these ions and substances. And therefore, we've got a buffer system. So partial neutralization of a weak with a strong will always create a buffer system. And then the third one, it's kind of a related idea. It's another partial neutralization. Remember, when you have a salt it's, that has a conjugate that's an active anion, so we've got an active conjugate base from a salt. It can be partially neutralized with a strong acid to once again create a significant quantity of the base with the conjugate acid. So 
any time we have any of these situations happening, we will create a buffer system. One is the easy one. That's the one you got to know inside and outside, totally get. But don't forget we also need to be aware of these things. There are some partial neutralizations of weak acids and its conjugate base. Partially neutralize either one and we're going to get the opposite. And as long as we have a significant quantity of both, we've created a buffer system. Now the ideal buffer is equimolar. We have equal mole amounts of both. Um, but even if it's not equimolar, you still create a buffer system. Next idea, weak strong titrations. This is a big one. Um, there's just a number of things you need to be really aware of. And in each of these steps in the weak strong and the strong strong, remember we're going to start by finding the moles of H plus and OH minus. Because when we compare how much H plus we have from our weak acid and how much OH minus we have from our strong base, when we compare those, it tells us where we're at in the titration. Now sometimes it's obvious from the words, but if it's not obvious, you need to really calculate your H plus and your OH minus. Because if you know where each of those are at, you know where you're at in the titration. And at each spot in a weak strong, you have to do the calculations different. In a strong strong, while the calculations aren't identical, they're very similar to each other. So um, in a strong strong titration, overall the math is easier. And maybe knowing where you're at is not quite as important, but the math is still different, similar but different. But in a weak situation with a titration with a strong, it's going to be very, very different. So once you've established where your H plus and OH minus is, if your H plus is the only thing there because it's before the titration has begun, then you need to understand all you really have is a weak acid thrown in water. Or in the case of a weak base being titrated with a strong acid, you got a weak base in water. So it's really just an equilibrium problem. In the case of a weak acid in water, it's a Ka problem. And remember, our Ka expression, when solved, really ends up with the x squared over Ha minus x equals the Ka. You neglect x, and x stands for the H plus. So a simple way to look at that is it kind of boils down to this. So before the titration, you just have a traditional weak acid problem. Now, before the equivalence point, You've neutralized some of your acid, and the big thing here is you have created a significant quantity of its conjugate base. So we have a weak acid in its conjugate base. This is the lambda buffer. henderson hasselbach H squared, is one of the easiest ways to go about solving this type of problem. So before the equivalence point, you have a weak, or you should say you have a buffer problem, and henderson hasselbach this equation right here, is one of the easiest ways to solve that. Remember, that is on the AP constant sheet. So that's the active equation that's happening here, our chemical reaction. And that would be the equation we use to eventually find pH. Now, the one extra thing that's happening in here is, remember at the half equivalence point, when these two concentrations are equal to each other, you're going to get the log of 1, which is 0. So pH equals pKa. And that's something that we exploited in the lab we did with this chapter. We identified the identity of an unknown weak acid by finding its half equivalence point, which is something relatively easy to do. Dissolve it in water, cut the volume exactly in half, titrate the half to the equivalence point, and then mix the two together, and we're at the half equivalence point. So it's one way to determine what the K of, is of an acid is. All you really have to do is find the pH at the half equivalence point. Next region here, we have the at the equivalence point. Now, at the equivalence point in a strong, strong, very simple situation. Here, we're still stuck with some equilibrium math. While it is true that we only have the conjugate base left because the weak acid and the strong base have perfectly neutralized each other, remember we were making a conjugate base, an active conjugate base in terms of pH. So this is going to function as a base in water. So what we're going to do here is we're going to do a KB problem. And remember, the KB is going to equal OH minus. So if they're asking for pH, be aware of that. And then after the equivalence point, we are in the last region. And this is one of the most convenient because this is the only step between the two that's actually same to the strong, strong. After the equivalence point, doesn't really matter that we've got a weak base there. It's being dramatically overshadowed by the fact that we have a whole bunch of extra OH minus. So realistically, our pH and our H plus are going to be totally driven by the fact that we've got some extra OH minus in there. So find out how much OH minus you have left. 
because remember, you have to evaluate how many moles you added in, subtract that from how many moles of H plus were in the weak acid, because that's going to neutralize that much OH minus. Find out how much OH minus you got left and divide by the total volume. And remember, once again here, you're getting OH minus, not H plus, so be careful of that. And that would be the weak, strong titration. Now, if it's a strong, strong titration, same idea. First, you've got to find the moles of H plus and OH minus. Now here, once you find them, I'm really just going to be comparing them in simple math. But you still need to start by finding that. And yes, technically, it still tells you where you're at in the titration. Now before the titration begins, what you really have is just a strong acid, or in the case of a strong base titration, a strong base. So remember, your H plus, in the case of a monoprotic strong acid, is literally the same thing as the concentration of the acid. If you're dealing with a strong base that's in your beaker that you're being titrating with a strong acid, got to realize, one, we're looking at a base, not an acid, so we're getting OH minus, not H plus. And two, remember, you have to evaluate both the concentration of the base and the formula base. Is it a monobasic or a dibasic or a tribasic base? Because each one is going to contribute different amounts of OH minus. So you end up multiplying by how many OHs are in the formula. So don't forget to evaluate by both criteria. Now, once we get uh, to actually performing a titration, now we've got other things going on. So before the equivalence point, what we've done is we've partially neutralized some of the H+. Now, unlike the week where we worried about what it was becoming, here it's making water and some salt that's made up of uh, anions and cations from Strong's, so they're not going to be active in terms of pH. So really all we have to do is find out how much H+, is left, and divide it by the total volume. At the equivalence point, Math becomes very simple. If you see it's strong, strong, and you're at the equivalence point, the pH has to be 7, which means the H plus and the OH minus have to equal 1 times 10 to the negative 7. So once you realize you're at the equivalence point, it's a very simple type of problem. You don't really need any equation at all. Now after the equivalence point, it's going to look familiar to what we looked at in the last situation. In a week strong after the equivalence point, we've got the same thing. We have extra OH minus now. So how much OH minus is left over? Which means we have to find out how much OH minus, subtract from the H plus that we were neutralizing it with, and then divide by the total volume, like in all cases here. So be aware and be careful when you're mixing volumes to get new concentrations. Got to divide by the total volume. Next, common ion effect. Your book says, this is pretty much what all books say, a weak electrolyte will ionize less when a strong electrolyte with a common ion is added to the solution. So basically if you have a weak reaction, so it's either a weak electrolyte because it's a weak acid or a weak base, um, or we could have um, other situations as well, but what you're often going to see is weak acid, weak base stuff because that's the easiest way to get a weak electrolyte. What you're going to end up with here is a situation where we have our normal equilibrium reaction drawn out like we have here. Now what this fundamentally says is if I add a salt that contributes this ion or something that contributes this ion, in this case a strong base, I have a strong electrolyte, so NaF would give me as a strong electrolyte, F minus, HCl as a strong acid would give me H plus or H3O plus. If I add either of those, that's going to shift equilibrium to the left, which is going to decrease the percent ionization or percent dose dissociation of HF. And that's really what the common ion effect says. If you add a common ion from the product side in an equilibrium reaction, you're going to shift equilibrium to the left and you're going to lower the percent ionization. Now, in this particular case, we looked at how that would look. But in terms of a math problem, it's a little bit more involved. So for math for this type of problem, remember you can solve this math using icebox and equilibrium expression. And one other thing to note here, the second section of this chapter dealt with buffer solutions. Well, buffer is really a common ion problem. So if you really don't want to use henderson hasselbach you can solve buffer problems exactly like we're looking at here. So really, you would set up a icebox type problem. So here's a typical problem one we did in the notes. So calculate the fluoride ion concentration and pH of a solution that is 0.20 molar in HF and 0.10 molar in HCl. So we have a weak acid, HF, that's our weak, and we're adding a strong acid to it with a common ion, the H+. What that's going to do is it's going to affect the equilibrium system, and it's going to affect what our pH and other things are. So here's our reaction, and this would be the Ka expression for that. Now when you set up your icebox, you need to realize that 
you have two things that are not zero here because we had HF and we had a strong acid. So our HF concentration started out at 0.2 and our strong acid was 0.1 molar. So those are non-zero values here. Now it makes sense not to have a zero here. We're kind of used to that. But realize you also do not have a zero here. Now since we're starting out with one of our products missing, we have to shift to the right. So our reactant concentration is going down by X and our two product concentrations are going up by X. And from there we would set up our traditional ice box situation. We would plug these things into this expression up here and you'd end up with 0.10 minus x times x over 0.20 minus x, and that's going to equal our Ka, which was 6.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. Now, normally what we do here is we neglect x with this x on the bottom. Well, we're going to do the same thing here, but we're also going to neglect it there. And now we can simplify the math, 0.1, and you can see that down here, times x over 0.2. And we can solve for what our x is. And yes, we should check to make sure that our percent, our 5% rule is valid here. And really, we don't need to check both of them. Check the smaller one. So is this, uh, if we check um, 1.4 times 10 to the negative 3 divided by 0.1 times 100, that gets less than 5%, then we know we're going to be good for both of them. Now, from here, once we know what x is, how do we finish the problem? Well, that will actually tell us our f minus. So we now have that, uh, but the second part of the question, I believe, was, if we go back to the beginning, calculate the concentration of the fluoride ion, which we just did, that was X, and the pH of the solution. Now, as far as pH goes, that's really driven by our H3O plus concentration. We've got that right through there. So if we know what H plus is, we can take the negative log of that, and we can use that to calculate our pH. Last situation here, precipitate problems. Now, in a precipitate problem, what we're really looking at is a low solubility substance, and really any solubility or any type of solid thrown into water that's soluble will work here. It's just that some things you can dissolve a lot more than others before you reach this point right here. If we dump in enough, we make a saturated solution and we'll have extra solid sitting on the bottom that is still dissolving, but it's recrystallizing at the same rate, so we have an equilibrium system when we reach a saturated solution. And typically we deal with low solubility substances with this. Now, since it's an equilibrium system at this point, Ka, which we will call Ksp, is going to equal, or not Ka, Kc, which we'll call Kc, Ksp, will equal the X plus concentration times the Y minus concentration. So we have a traditional equilibrium problem here. Now, if we want to determine whether we get a precipitate when we mix a salt containing this ion and a salt containing that ion together, so if we're combining these two things together, will we get a precipitate? Well, it really depends on how what we call Q, we'll talk about that in a second, compares to our calculated KSP value. So we'll know the KSP for this particular salt, because we can look that up in a table. Now, if we don't know if we're at equilibrium or not, because if Q equals KSP, then the system's at equilibrium and you have exactly a saturated solution, there won't be any precipitate there. So if we mix the perfect amount of X plus and Y minus, then we'll exactly equal KSP. And since we're not sure if we're at equilibrium, we call it a Q value, just like we did before. So we plug those in and calculate. If our Q equals our KSP, we know we're at saturation, but we don't have any left over to form a precipitate. Now, if Q is less than KSP, then basically what's happening is any solid that would ever form is going to immediately redissolve. You don't have enough to reach a saturated solution here. So if our Qs are too small, our X plus times our Y minus is going to yield too small of a number. We didn't have a high enough concentration to actually get to saturation. And if Q is greater than KSP, that meant we had extra. So we had more than enough. We're going to reach saturation, and we're going to have a precipitate forming. Now, one thing to be aware of, if you're combining two liquids together, you're changing the volume, and that has an effect on concentration. So remember to find out what your moles of H or X plus and H, Y minus are, and then divide them by the total volume to get the new concentration. Be very, very, very careful of that.
Now, that ends our look at some of our misconceptions. The next thing I want to look at is just kind of an overview of ideas from this chapter. So from chapter 17, just some basic concepts, math and idea-wise that you should be aware of to make sure you're prepared for the test. And I'm going to gloss through this kind of fast, but you can slow it down and look more closely at any of the ideas that we end up discussing here. Now, first section dealt with common ion effects, 17.1. Remember, it's always a strong electrolyte being added to a weak electrolyte. And what happens is we know it's going to lower the solubility or lower the pre percent ionization. So that's really what's happening in common ion effect. Now, you should be able to predict qualitatively, which means understand which way equilibrium is going to shift here, and then know what that's going to end up doing to our solubility or percent ionization. You should also be able to calculate pHs of these type problems, 17.1 and 17.2 in your book. Look at that, as well as some stuff we did in notes. Um, and you should be able to look at the effect on the solubility of a common ion. And that's something we looked at in 17.1 and remember, um, this is really the same math as what we talk about with buffer. So you can actually do um, any common ion effect with a henderson hasselbach style calculation if you really want to. And that brings us to the next section. Buffer systems this is a direct application of common ion. Remember, this is a, a weak acid or base with its conjugate forming a buffer. Significant quantities of both. It can buffer or protect from pH changes by the addition of an acid or a base because it has a significant quantity of an acid and a significant quantity of base. Understand the three different ways it can be formed. Make sure you understand that. Um, and basically be able to do math with it, either using the same math as the common ion like we looked at, or you can do henderson hasselbach Either one works. And remember, there are some sample problems of types of calculations you should be able to do uh, in your book that are related to this. Next would be titrations. We spent a long time on titration, so I'm not going to spend much time here. Uh, but you need to be, recognize which you are, strong, strong, or weak, strong. That's critical. And remember, you always start by evaluating your H plus and OH minus amounts. And they're going to be neutralizing each other. And through the course of the strong, strong, or the weak, strong, different things are going to happen that have different types of relevance. So if you want to look more closely at that, pause the tape here. Otherwise, I'm going to move on quickly to the weak. Remember, this is the one that's more involved. There's more things happening here, which is why I spent a great deal of time with this on the misconception part of this video. And remember, after you start the titration, before you get to the equivalence point, it's really a buffer problem. Then it becomes a KB problem, because all you have left is your conjugate base. And then it becomes just like a strong, strong above the equivalence point. You just have extra OH minus left, from which you can calculate the OH minus and H plus concentrations, and therefore the pH. Remember, know what happens the pH of the equivalence point in a strong, strong, or either of the weak to strong situations. You need to be aware of, at the equivalence point, whether you're going to be acidic, basic, or neutral. And I have a rough idea about how the titration curves are going to look with these things. That's an idea we looked at in your notes. So you should be familiar with titration curves, and that concept of half equivalence point can be very, very useful in finding the Ka. And know how to choose an appropriate indicator. Remember, it needs to be changing color for your indicator in the same range of pH that your endpoint or your equivalence point is. Next, we get into solubility equilibrium. Remember, this is the KSP stuff. Once again, we talked a little bit about this, so I'm not going to say too much other than the fact that, you know, there's different types of calculations you should be aware of. And checking in your notes and in your book, you can see some of those sample types of problems to make sure you understand how to do various things with this. And remember, <clears throat> you should understand how the solubility of things can be affected uh, by... Where are we? Oops mentioned in here. Um, yes, how effective pH could affect the solubility, how common ion can affect the solubility, and also you should understand the metal complex idea and how that can affect solubility as, as well. So these are some ideas related to the concept of precipitation and dissolving slightly soluble salts. And that ends our help with the Chapter 17 movie. Good luck, and I hope this helps you do the best you can.